We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. You got speed, John Glenn. Roger, zero G, and I feel fine. Where my feet are out. Okay, I'm out. Really looks funny out there. See my glove out there, Jim. Jimmy Four, get back yet. Okay. Good morning, Gordo. Yes, how are you? How does it feel for the United States to be the new record holder? At last, huh? By cooperating together in these new realms of infinity. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Houston, uh... Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Hello and welcome. This is Michael Annis, and you're listening to episode 54 of the Space Rocket History Podcast. I recommend listening to episode 53 before you listen to this episode. And now, Jiminy 2, Part 2. We left off the previous episode with testing on GLV-2. Now let's turn our attention to the spacecraft. The second phase of testing on the Gemini spacecraft at St. Louis had lasted through August and into September of 1964, with frequent interruptions for the receipt and installation of a number of pieces of flight equipment. A simulated flight on September 15th completed testing. A spacecraft acceptance review board headed by Charles Matthews had already gone over the spacecraft to make sure it was ready for the final simulation. The board met again on September 17th and decided that Spacecraft 2 was now ready for delivery. It was shipped to Florida the following Monday, September 21st. At last, Spacecraft and Booster were together at the Cape. However, GLV-2's misfortunes during August and September forced NASA to forego its goal of a manned Gemini 3 flight before the end of the year. Gemini Titan 2 was now scheduled for mid-November 1964 and Gemini 3 for the end of January 1965. There seemed no need to alter planned dates for the later missions, although the schedules would have to be tightened. In the meantime, Gemini's slowness was highlighted by a Russian first. On October 12th, the Soviet Union orbited Voskhod 1, which we covered in episodes 44 and 45. The three-man crew flew in flight coveralls rather than spacesuits, and all remained in the spacecraft to a landing instead of ejecting as cosmonauts had previously done. Here's a clip of the news. Suddenly, on October 12, 1964, Columbus Day, dedicated to the discoverer of America, Radio Moscow steals our thunder. We learn that Russia, while we're still training for two-man flights, has orbited a team of three aboard a new model spacecraft called Voskhod, meaning sunrise. On September 24th, GLV began an expected two weeks of subsystem tests. The combined systems tests that preceded spacecraft mating were scheduled for October 6th. Spacecraft 2 should have taken only 11 working days in the hangar before it joined the booster at the launch complex on October 25th. But once again, work on the booster went smoothly but the spacecraft lagged. GLV-2 completed subsystems test and the pre-mate test on schedule. In another week, the launch vehicle finished electrical electronic interference test and the last step before it was ready to receive the spacecraft. As a side note, while the launch vehicle was being tested, so was the worldwide tracking network. From October 9th to the 16th, Goddard and MSC put the tracking stations through their paces. Back to the spacecraft. The spacecraft, however, had still not made it out to the pad. Work on the spacecraft had gone well enough the first week, but trouble cropped up in getting the thrusters ready for a static firing test. After firing, the system had to be flushed and purged, which was another delay. 
By October 10th, Spacecraft 2 was already eight days behind schedule. It lost another two days while pyrotechnics were installed. Spacecraft 2 was 10 days late when it reached Launch Complex 19 on Sunday, October 18th, and it was placed in the tripod in the White Room an hour before noon. Attempts to run the spacecraft premate system test brought new problems. As one was solved, another appeared, and it was October 27th before the test was complete. The final step before the spacecraft was joined to the launch vehicle was a premate simulated flight run in two parts. Despite more than one discrepancy revealed by the test, the spacecraft was mechanically mated to its booster by noon Thursday, November 5th. After the mating, Martin conducted tank exercises on the launch vehicle to check calibration to see whether or not the launch crew could load the tanks accurately with the equipment on hand and to train for launch loading. The Martin crew found some differences between the data gathered from calibration and what they thought they had loaded. This led to a series of tanking exercises throughout the program and setup. The troubled course of testing and checkout now improved. Over the next month, any problems that showed up were quickly handled as Gemini 2 ticked off the milestones on its way to a December 9th launch. Electrical interface integration validation was completed on November 9th. Joint guidance and control test was completed on November 12th. Joint combined systems test after electrical mating was completed on November 17th. Wet mock simulated launch was completed on November 24th. Spacecraft final systems test was completed on November 28th. Simulated flight test was completed on December 3rd, and launch pre-count test was completed on December 7th. Gemini 2 would be the first Gemini mission requiring controller support. For Gemini 1, the Cape Mission Control Center flight support was limited to an informal evaluation of the Titan rocket systems and launch trajectory support by the booster and trajectory controllers. But on Gemini 2, the control team was tasked with issuing backup commands if the sequencer failed during the planned 18-minute flight. The commands would separate the Gemini spacecraft from the Titan rocket, fire the separation rockets, and initiate the turnaround maneuver for re-entry. On Tuesday, December 8th, an hour before midnight, propellant loading on GLV-2 began. The loading finished shortly after 3 a.m. in the morning of December 9th. The final countdown started an hour later. It went smoothly, but not quite so smoothly as the first Gemini countdown. There were three holds for a total of 41 minutes. The count reached zero at 11.41 a.m. Wednesday morning, and the first stage engines ignited. One second later, a signal from the master operations control set shut down the engine. Flight controllers in the Cape Control Center observed that the launch vehicle had lost hydraulic pressure in its primary control system and was switched over from primary to secondary guidance and control. Within the blockhouse, technicians began to power down the spacecraft, and at three minutes before noon, flight director Chris Kraft officially canceled the flight. The source of the shutdown command was the master operations control set. It was an automatic response to an automatic function. The command was triggered by the switchover from primary to secondary flight control during the 3.2 seconds between ignition and liftoff. After the engines ignited, The launch vehicle was programmed to remain bolted to the stand until thrust built up to 70% of maximum. During that time, a switchover in the control system would automatically cause a shutdown. The GLV-2 switchover followed automatically when the booster's malfunction detection system sensed the pressure drop in the primary hydraulic system. 
GLV-2, in other words, spotted its own hydraulic failure, responded by switching over to its secondary system, and then, because it was still on the ground, commanded its engine to shut off. Having saved itself, GLV-2 stood poised on the pad, a giant question mark. Why had its primary control system failed? The answer was quick in coming. Unexpectedly high pressure in one of the hydraulic lines had burst the aluminum housing of a servo valve, letting the hydraulic fluid leak out. This valve controlled one of the booster's four tandem actuators. You remember these are the devices that move the thrust chambers to steer the vehicle in flight. The failure of the valve housing was a lesson in the folly of unneeded improvement. At some time during development, someone had decided that the walls of the housing were twice as thick as they needed to be. A third of a centimeter of aluminum was ample to meet design pressures. No one, however, thought to test the actual pressure the housing would have to withstand, nor was any impulse test as such included in system qualifications. More likely than not, one or another Titan II had suffered the same sort of hard start, but the stouter housings that remained standard with the missile could survive such a pulse, while the lighter structured shell in the Gemini booster could not. When GLV-2 shut down, Spacecraft 2 posed something of a problem. Launch crews knew what to do with a ready-to-go booster, since they had dealt with that after the mock launch test. However, there was no comparable background for the spacecraft, and that led to some hasty improvisation. Aside from its propellants, the spacecraft bristled with pyrotechnic devices, all armed for the flight. Should one of them explode, the results could be catastrophic. Draining the booster of propellants was first priority. This took the rest of Wednesday and half of Thursday to complete. Then it was time for the tricky operation of pulling the pyrotechnics from the isolation valves that barred the propellants from the spacecraft thrusters until time to fire. The procedure was complicated by the fact that the explosive cartridge was not a replaceable unit and the whole valve assembly had to come out. But this might allow propellants to reach the thrusters or to spill their highly noxious chemicals over the workers. The makeshift answer was to freeze the propellant lines, but no one was quite sure how to freeze the lines. After one or two failed attempts, copper tubing was wrapped around the lines, which were packed in dry ice. Liquid nitrogen was run through the tubing, and the whole thing was sprayed with CO2. That worked, and the valve assemblies were replaced over the weekend. There was really not much that could be done with the spacecraft over the next few weeks, besides making sure it remained in flight status, and nothing much more could be done with the launch vehicle until new actuators arrived. A product of MOG Servo Control Incorporated, the tandem actuators had been taken back to the vendor's plant in East Aurora, New York, for extensive test. Then the actuators had gone to Martin, Baltimore, for further testing. The lightweight servo valves had to be redesigned. Work was further curtailed by the holidays. A messenger reached the Cape with the four new parts on January 6th, 1965. They were installed at once and testing resumed, focusing mainly on the flight control system. A new round of launch preparations went quickly. On Thursday, January 14th, the last major test was complete. Reviews of the spacecraft and the launch vehicle gave both a clean bill of health, and the launch was now set for 9 o'clock Tuesday morning, January 19th. For this launch, the press was allowed inside the control room. Launch coverage was provided by fixed cameras and lights on both sides of the room, 
with a roving camera coupled by an umbilical cord to a recorder. Coverage was not live with this launch, but it would be live on later launches. All the press coverage seemed excessive for such a short flight, but it was a launch that kicked off the next round in the race to the moon. The countdown began two hours past midnight. It was almost flawless, although it did produce one disappointment. Spacecraft 2 had been slated to carry six fuel cells of the old model P-2B, left over after the design had been updated early in 1964. Despite their known defects, flight testing them with the reactant supply system seemed like a good idea, but only on a non-interference with flight basis and with a dummy load, since electrical power would actually be supplied by the batteries. The six stacks assigned to Spacecraft 2 had behaved erratically since they were first installed in St. Louis. When they acted up during the aborted countdown on December 9th and threatened to delay the launch, they were scratched from the mission. Only one stack proved to be still operable. It was activated on December 18th, then shut off and left alone until the next launch attempt. An hour and a half after the countdown started, on January 19th, Hydrogen intake to the stack was blocked by a stuck valve. Two hours of work left troubleshooters faced with breaking the spacecraft wiring to correct the problem. Since that would have meant a hold in the countdown, the attempt to activate the stack was called off, and the fuel cells were not operated on Gemini 2. Aside from the fuel cell problem, the countdown produced only minor anomalies. At four minutes after 9 a.m. Tuesday morning, Gemini 2 was successfully launched, but as it launched, a problem occurred in the control room. Here is an eyewitness account of what happened in the control room by the backup flight director, Gene Krantz. Quote, Then everything in mission control turned black as the Titan lifted off. It was so dark I could not read my stopwatches. We had been plunged into a power failure because of the overload caused by the TV lighting. The only illumination in the room came from the small buttons on the Western Electric intercom sets which were provided with a battery backup. Working blind, I listened to the reports from the launch pad, unable to do anything. The controller in the dark monitored reports coming in from ships downrange. It turned out the controller team was prepared for anything except a total blackout. With the power outage, control of the mission was transferred to a tracking ship. The outage was later traced to an overload of the electrical system from the network television equipment used to cover the launch. The press powered up their lights and cameras, and the surge momentarily overloaded the circuit breakers and cut the power to the entire control center at the Cape. To ensure this never happened again, critical systems were reassigned between two separate electrical circuits powered by three different electrical sources, and the press was required to provide its own power. Now back to the flight. GLV-2 hurled the spacecraft 3,430 kilometers across the South Atlantic through an arc that peaked 160 kilometers above the ocean's surface. The spacecraft was run by the onboard automatic sequencer. At 6 minutes 54 seconds after launch, retro rockets were fired. The spacecraft endured the most severe heating Gemini was ever likely to meet as it plunged back into the atmosphere. Its heat protection proved its structural integrity uncompromised and all systems working. It dropped into the South Atlantic on its parachute. The flight lasted 18 minutes and 16 seconds. The landing was 26 kilometers short of the planned impact point and 83 kilometers from the recovery aircraft carrier 
the USS Lake Champlain. Jiminy, too, bobbed in the water for an hour and a half until it was picked up by the carrier. Spacecraft was brought aboard at 10.52 a.m. Eastern Time. Here's how NASA described the mission. During the early morning hours of January 19, 1965, at Pad 19, Cape Kennedy, Florida, the countdown began for GT-2, the second flight test of the Gemini program. This flight, an unmanned suborbital flight, was to be one of the most crucial in the Gemini program. It was designed to flight qualify the spacecraft and launch vehicle for manned spaceflight. In this mission, vital information would be gained on re-entry heating and heat protection, spacecraft equipment would be checked for proper operation during flight, and information necessary to ensure safety of the flight crews on future manned Gemini missions would be obtained. The spacecraft for this mission was manufactured and assembled at the McDonnell Aircraft Corporation, St. Louis, Missouri, prime contractor for the Gemini spacecraft. The launch vehicle, a modified Titan II, was developed by the U.S. Air Force and the Martin Company, Baltimore, Maryland. The final checkout of the spacecraft and launch vehicle systems proceeded normally, and approximately 90 minutes before liftoff, the spacecraft hatches were closed and torqued. The white room at the top of pad 19 was then dismantled in preparation for lowering of the erector. As the countdown proceeded, pad personnel left the area and the erector was lowered. Meanwhile, at the mission control center, flight controllers closely monitored spacecraft equipment and completed final preparations for the launch. Instruments were set to record the flight trajectory and other vital information which would be transmitted by telemetry from the spacecraft during flight. Monitors in the blockhouse checked and double-checked their instruments, maintaining close control over the launch vehicle, which would propel the spacecraft downrange for this vital test. At approximately four minutes past 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, the Gemini launch vehicle lifts from the pad and begins the powered phase of the downrange flight. Seconds after liftoff, a white vapor trail marks the path of the vehicle through the atmosphere, ending near the spot that the vehicle reached max Q, or maximum dynamic pressure. Some two and a half minutes after liftoff, the booster engine cuts off and staging occurs. The sustainer engine then takes over to propel the spacecraft to a maximum altitude of 98 and 9 tenths statute miles and a top speed of 16,708 and 9 tenths miles per hour. After separation from the launch vehicle, the spacecraft orbital attitude and maneuvering system thrusters fire to turn the spacecraft in orbit to blunt end forward. The adapter equipment section is jettisoned. The spacecraft is oriented to the proper retrograde firing attitude. The retro rockets are fired automatically in sequence to slow the spacecraft and begin the re-entry phase of the mission. After retro firing, the retro adapter section is jettisoned and the re-entry control system thrusters fire to place the spacecraft in a constant roll rate of 15 degrees per second. The roll rate stops, and the six-foot pilot parachute deploys, pulling away the R&R &R section and deploying the main parachute. The spacecraft shifts from a one to a two-point Gemini-type chute suspension and gently floats to the sea below. The spacecraft landed in the prime recovery area, about 20 miles west of the Navy carrier Lake Champlain. It had traveled a total of 2,127 statute miles in just over 19 minutes. Department of Defense recovery forces, already deployed along the flight path, immediately go into action. U.S. Navy swimmers and their equipment are dropped at the scene by helicopters from the recovery carrier. The equipment includes a flotation collar, which is attached to the spacecraft to provide additional buoyancy until the spacecraft can be lifted out of the water. Meanwhile, other helicopters search the surrounding area for the rendezvous and reentry module. This section, lined with buoyant material, was recovered about a half mile from the spacecraft, an extra bonus in the Gemini 2 success story. Then the Lake Champlain pulls alongside. A huge crane swings out over the spacecraft, and at 10.45 a.m., just an hour and 41 minutes after liftoff, the spacecraft is hoisted from the water. The flotation collar removed, the spacecraft is placed on a special dolly on the deck of the carrier, to await return to Cape Kennedy for complete analysis and inspection. 
Gemini 2, the re-entry mission to qualify the spacecraft for manned flight, is complete. Visual inspection on board the carrier indicates mission success. Mr. Charles W. Matthews, Gemini program manager, had this to say about the mission. On the basis of first-look information, we foresee no trouble that would hold up the first manned mission. Most of the mission goals were achieved, except, of course, the fuel cells failed before liftoff and were turned off. And the spacecraft cooling system temperature was found to be too high. But the Gemini 2 spacecraft was in excellent condition with only minor scratches, chars, and corrosion from exposure to the seawater. Gemini 2's heat shield and retro rockets functioned as expected. Here's how NASA described the success. In the days that followed, detailed analysis of the spacecraft confirmed the first impressions of NASA engineers on the deck of the Champlain. The mission, GT-2, was a success. Spacecraft 2 had been taken from the water without leaks and was structurally sound. It had withstood a re-entry trajectory planned to create maximum heating on both the heat shield and afterbodies. There was practically no damage. All major onboard systems were flight qualified. Exceptions such as drinking water, food, and waste management would be independently qualified by other means before the flight of GT-3. In fact, the capsule was in such good shape that it was refurbished and flown again on November 3, 1966 in a test flight for the U.S. Air Force Manned Orbiting Laboratory Program. It was launched on a Titan 3C rocket on a 33-minute suborbital flight from Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral. It is the only Gemini spacecraft to have flown with the U.S. Air Force insignia. All told, the Gemini 2 mission was supported by 6,562 United States Department of Defense personnel, 67 aircrafts, and 16 ships. The post-flight news conference was a scene of quiet jubilation with pats on the back for everyone involved, and more importantly, nothing occurred on the mission that would in any way stop the forthcoming launch of Gemini 3, the first Gemini to carry men into space. On Tuesday afternoon, just a few hours after the launch of Gemini 2, the program received another vote of confidence. Although the second launch had been long delayed, the nature of the delays in no way cast doubts on Gemini itself. NASA and its contractors decided that Gemini missions should be launched at two-month intervals instead of the three-month cycle then planned. Later events were to show that fitting astronaut training into the shorter schedule was a harder task, although it produced no problems that could not be surmounted. While most eyes had been focused on Gemini 2 at Cape Kennedy, Work on the still-to-be-resolved development problems continued elsewhere. Two spacecraft systems indispensable for Gemini's first manned mission, the thrusters and ejection seats, remained question marks through most of 1964. And a third, the fuel cells, though not slated for Gemini 3, was as yet unqualified. What may have been the largest question of all centered on the Gemini Agena, which throughout 1964 fell further behind schedule. The most difficult and stubborn problems centered in Agena's command and communication system. The electronic devices for tracking the vehicle, monitoring its subsystems, and passing commands to the vehicle in orbit. Because of Gemini's unique demand for rendezvous and docking, Lockheed had to design and prove a new command and communication system for the Gemini Agena. During testing in October, however, parts of the system started acting up. Troubleshooting got Gemini Agena Test Vehicle 5001 through its testing, but it seemed all too likely that the command and communication system suffered from basic defects in its mechanical and electronic design. When the problems persisted, the Air Force insisted on redesign, and Lockheed finally initiated 
a 10-point plan for command and communication equipment in February 1965. Astronaut training proceeded through 1964 as well. Here is a clip of Robert Gilruth introducing the nine new astronauts that would join the original Mercury astronauts. Mr. Neil A. Armstrong, Air Force Major Frank Borman, Navy Lieutenant Charles Conrad, Jr., Navy Lieutenant Commander James A. Lovell, Air Force Captain James A. McDivitt, Mr. Elliot M. C., Jr., Air Force Captain Thomas B. Stafford, Air Force Captain Edward H. White II, and Navy Lieutenant Commander John W. Young. And here is a clip of NASA on astronaut training that occurred in 1964. Continuous astronaut training parallels Gemini hardware development. We can distinguish four areas of emphasis in astronaut training, monitoring and evaluation of engineering design and hardware, test participation either as observer or active subject, flight simulation, and formal academic courses in the basic disciplines underlying space exploration. The future Gemini pilot comes into the program as a trained engineer scientist. He acquires a particular vantage point as an astronaut to share with other Gemini engineers. Much of the astronaut's time is scheduled for visits to contractor facilities, familiarizing himself with the hardware, and participating in tests. Test participation is a major area of astronaut preparation for a mission. Astronaut James Lovell, along with NASA engineer Gordon Harvey, were the subjects for the first seaworthiness test of Static Article 5. Held in the Gulf of Mexico on April 4, 1964, the test sought to demonstrate the seaworthiness and stability of spacecraft structure during a delayed post-landing recovery. The test would also check out the onboard systems, particularly communications, electrical, and environmental control. It would study the physiological reactions of the subjects under the constraints of spacesuit, cabin, and sea conditions. After two hours, the test was terminated because of operational deterioration of some equipment in the spacecraft. A post-landing inspection revealed corrosion in the environmental control and electrical systems. NASA and McDonnell crews reworked the spacecraft and went back into the Gulf ready to run a successful test. Wind that day was approximately 10 knots and rising, and a hurricane threat eventually terminated the test. But it had run 16 hours and 35 minutes, sufficient time to demonstrate that the onboard systems would now function well in a delayed recovery. Although the astronauts, Lovell and Bean, were uncomfortable because of the temperature within the spacecraft, a later test confirmed that this can be improved by partially opening the cabin hatch and by removing the pressure suit after two hours. Astronaut Schweikert conducted an eight-day evaluation of the suit. He flew in a jet aircraft to test it under high gravity conditions, underwent flight simulation in the mission trainer for four days, and wore it during centrifuge tests at Ames Research Center. On October 26th, he removed the suit for the first time in eight days. Biomedical instrumentation had functioned satisfactorily. The suit design presented only a minor moisture problem in the glove area, which has since been resolved. The most important single piece of hardware which the astronaut uses to prepare for a flight is the mission simulator. The two Gemini mission simulators were delivered to NASA during the year. The first, stationed at Cape Kennedy, has the GT-3 configuration. On November 9th, the prime flight crew for that mission, Command Pilot Virgil Grissom and Pilot John Young, began training on the Cape Kennedy simulator. Command Pilot Walter Schirra and Pilot Thomas Stafford are the backup flight crew. The mission simulator is also tied in with a control center and tracking network to provide simultaneous training of flight controllers. The next month, the second simulator in the GT-4 configuration was operational and located at the Manned Spacecraft Center. Chosen for the second flight, planned to be a four-day mission, are Command Pilot James McDivitt and Pilot Edward White. The backup flight crew is Command Pilot Frank Borman and Pilot James Lovell. 
The simulators are computer-driven and controlled by an instructor at the console. The instructor can program a part of the mission or the entire mission from pre-launch to post-landing on tape. Critical portions of the mission can be rerun and emphasized. Problems and errors unknown to the astronauts can be introduced at any time by the instructor. The crew must immediately recognize the problem, evaluate it on the spot, and take corrective action as though faced with that problem in actual flight. Crews for GT-3 are scheduled for approximately 120 hours of mission simulator training. This may be compared with the estimated five hours of the mission itself. As 1965 dawned, Project Gemini had cleared most of the hurdles in its path. The past year had seen its last serious development problems overcome. Agena was perhaps not as far along as it should be, but there was plenty of talent working on it. The repeated setbacks suffered by GLV-2 could only be seen as acts of God, not defects in technology. That could not be said of its failure on December 9th, but little more than a month of hard work it was needed to put matters right. The Gemini 2 mission almost matched Gemini 1 in the quality of performance. And now, at last, Gemini's spacecraft and launch vehicle had been proved. All that remained, the last hurdle, was sending men into space. Although the publicly scheduled date for Gemini 3 was the second quarter of 1965, Charles Matthews told the Gemini management panel shortly after the flight of Gemini 2 that late March looked like a good bet for the Gemini 3 launch. Thanks for listening to this archive episode of the Space Rocket History Podcast. If you are financially able, please support the podcast by going to the homepage spacerockethistory.com and clicking on the orange donate button or the Patreon link. Thanks.